Hi everyone. This is the second episode of the history of rock music with Amy and Kara. And the first episode, which hopefully you've watched, focused on kind of the pre-rock period with, and some of the influences that played into rock, the, the blues influence and the big band swing influence. Now we are stepping into the first decade of rock music, um, which is the 50s. And I have Carl here with me and we're going to discuss the two songs that I listened to this week. If you haven't watched those two first listens, I highly recommend that you check them out. The links are right here because it will give you some context and, and material to which we'll be talking about in this discussion. And I think you'll enjoy it more if you've listened to those first. So the first song which we'll be discussing is Rock Around the Clock. And great. here's Carl. Thanks, Amy. Um, okay, so Rock Around the Clock is a significant piece of music. Um, it was put out by Bill Haley in his comments, as you are aware. And the first thing that will normally strike most people is the upbeat, happy feel mm -hmm. of the yeah, song. definitely. Right from the word go. And something to notice is notice how the drums are the driving force at the beginning. Da da, boom. Definitely. Yeah. And then you start going through one, two, three o'clock, mm -hmm. four o'clock rock. Now, this is unusual in music, particularly for that time, because you are now not necessarily going melodic side, but the rhythm is starting to come into play. And that's because it's danceable music. And as we've discussed in the previous episodes, this idea of changing towards a dance focused type of uh, music where you could jive and do the jitterbug and other famous uh, dances, which became even more prevalent later on as uh, music uh, carried on its development in the rock genre. Um, rock Around the Clock was considered to be the very first rock song that charted as number one on the Billboard pop charts in the United ah, States. I see. Okay. That's why it's significant. This song was very culturally relevant, uh, very much so because of what was going on in the world around it, both on the political and social side. Um, America was a very conservative country mm -hmm. during the early 50s. Mm -hmm. You also had McCarthyism going on, the Red Scare, right. where everyone hated communists, better red than dead, blah, 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 how times have changed. Um, <laughs> but putting that aside for the moment, um, and I'm not going to get too deep into it right now, but teenagers were finding their own place in society and they wanted their own form of music. And like many generations prior to them, and we even see this in today's society, Oh, the kids of today. They're lazy. They're impolite. They're you, irresponsible. Yeah, disrespectful. Exactly. All the monikers that happen, by the way, in every culture, in every generation. So, of course, the teenagers of the day, and teenagers were only an invention after the Second World War. When the parents came home uh, from the war, or when the husbands came home from the war in most cases, uh, the baby boom started because everyone mm -hmm. finally got right, home to right. be together and we know what happens then. Um, and so the numbers of young people who were being born were quite dramatic. Mm -hmm. And there was a shift in mentality on the intellectual side of what it meant to be a child. Um, right. If you look back in the Edwardian period, the 1910s, the 1920s, a child of Basically miniature adults in a That's in a way. exactly yeah. what I was going to say. Mm -hmm. They were miniature versions of their adult even in the Even in the way they were dressed. Yeah. We, you have we a made baby. them look, yeah, and they you look the, like an adult yeah. the way they go. And they never had a chance to find their own identity. Yeah. It was given to you. Now, coming out of the Second World War, everyone was just so happy to get out of the Depression in the 1930s and 1940s, which we discussed in the previous video. And now there was money because when one takes a look at what happened during the Second World War, Britain, France, Belgium, Holland, all these countries were decimated by the Germans. Right, right. Germany was decimated by the British and Americans. So they had no ability, they had no industry base anymore in Europe, but America did. Because right, America okay. wasn't attacked yeah. on its home territory, less Pearl Harbor, but the mainland wasn't attacked right. by the Japanese, even though they wanted to. So America was all set to take over the world economically, and that's exactly what Took they off. did. Yeah. So as the economy expanded, 
people had spare money for the first time. And more importantly, teenagers had spare money for the first time. Now, as I've already said, due to cultures and the way our cultures work, kids look at their parents and they're square or they're dull or they're boring, not realizing their parents were very similar to them when they were <laughs> their age. But that's just the way that we work. So during the 1950s, you had young people who now had money, mm -hmm. who had freedom of time to do things. Right, And there was right. also the automobile, which was a way yes. of freedom. Which often, uh, there was a radio in the vehicle which you could listen to music on. Now, in addition to this, because you had teenagers who had lots of money, they needed to use their money for certain things. And again, I'm not saying the 1950s was liberal because it wasn't. It was still very conservative. But one of the ways that teenagers spent money was at movie cinemas. Mm -hmm. Watching movies of the famous uh, people that they really liked, uh, James Dean. It, it doesn't, there, there's a whole pile and of... And the movie industry was booming it, too. It was definitely booming, especially coming out of the Second World War. When you go to a movie theater, and I, I ask all of you out there in uh, YouTube land, think about it when you go to the movie. What's one of the reasons, at least in the past, we went to see movies? Well, first off, it's a huge screen. But secondly, the sound. Mm. If you think about Star Wars, and I know I'm dating myself, in 1977 when I went to Star Wars for the very first time, the sound, you couldn't get it at home. And neither could these kids. Rock Around the Clock, right. in, interestingly enough, there was a movie put out with Glenn Ford called Blackboard Jungle, okay. which I advise anyone to go and check it out. I'll have to check it out. It, I haven't seen it. It's a little hokey, but that, that's okay. That's the way Hollywood made movies back then. And what it's about, it's a, about an inner city school with Glenn Ford is Mr. Daddy, 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 I think is what it was because they call him Daddy-O in the movie. Um, but he takes over essentially a, a classroom full of juvenile delinquents and it shows what he goes through. Now, when they made the movie, Glenn Ford, this movie was designed and targeted more at the teenage group I because see. they could relate to the struggles, especially inner city kids of what was going on at the time. Right, right. And the problems that they were running up against. Well, they needed a song for it and the producer director of the, or rather the director of the movie actually spoke to Glenn Ford's son who had a large record collection, larger than most of his uh, friends. And one of the songs in there was Rock Around the Clock by uh, Bill yeah, Haley. Okay, uh -huh. So he said, well, here's a good one. And the guy loved the song because it caught the idea of this new generation and a different style of music. That was put in as the theme music for the Blackboard Jungle. Ah, I see. You have all these kids going to see the movie, and it's coming out of huge speakers that they've never heard before. So everybody's hearing it. And the kids actually were getting up and dancing at the opening of the song. <laughs> Naturally, song soars straight up, because yes, the kids now have an identity. They identify with the music. They identify with the movie combined together. It was bound to do really well. So... Rock Around the Clock soars up the charts. Now, it still has its origins in the previous forms of music that we talked about. Yes, I could hear that. Yes, you got this swing drum. Dun, 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 dun. Uh -huh. That's your drum part that's going on in the background and you're doing it on the rim of the uh, snare drum. It's also 12-bar blues, which again, for those of you who didn't watch the previous video, I actually played a 12-bar blues on the guitar. That's the format that it was using. So you've got blues, you've got swing, but you've got this brand new feel called rock and roll. And I would argue this is one of the primary first rock and roll tunes out there. It's danceable. Interesting, interesting. And if you remember, if we go back to a videos, a number of videos ago, in fact, the very first video we had with myself and my two business partners, Graham mm -hmm. and Tice, and we talked about what makes a what rock makes song. What makes rock rock. And one of the things we said was the lyrics are edgy. Now, rock around the clock in today's day and age, yeah, okay, that doesn't seem like a big deal. In 1950s, that was a big deal. What is rocking around the clock? Well, it's 8, 9, 10, 11, 2, and I'll be going strong, and so will you. Yeah, what does that actually mean? That was very edgy for the yeah, time. Yeah. I can, Again, I can see that. kids, I want to listen to things that are different from my parents, so I want to find music that my parents don't like. This has edgy songs or lyrics to it as well. So all of these combined things where it was 
very upbeat. It was not like the other musics of the time, like country that was going on, the swooners who right. played very laid back, very clean music. This was far more aggressive um, for the time. And again, we look back on it and say, well, isn't that quaint? Yeah, but at the time, it was shattering the yeah, way we I did business. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so um, as a result, Rock Around the Clock became a very, very big song because it appealed to this new generation that had money to spend on the records. Now, I'm kicking myself. I did not bring a 45. On one of our later presentations, I've got 45s at home and I'm going to show one to everybody. So those people who may never have seen a 45, you're going to see what a 45 looked like. This goes back to the length of the song. As you said in your part of your presentation, you said, well, it's a fairly short song. Yes. And there's a number of reasons for that. First off, it was on a 45. There's not a huge amount of recording time on a 45. So there are technical limitations to it. Another point that you brought up in your presentation was it wasn't as full and ballsy as some of the other uh, music that you were listening to from prior. Well, that was because of recording rec uh, standards. I see. Often there'd be one microphone in the middle of a room. It probably wasn't the greatest mic. It might've been okay. They were recording on four tracks or less, maybe even a one track, where everyone's playing the same thing and it's going down. Yeah, the recording ability was not that great. But at the time, people at home didn't have huge stereo systems. Right. They right. just they may be listening to it through, you know, a, a six inch speaker. So all of these things, when you take them into account, shows where this is now starting to develop. We're seeing the seeds of coming out of the jazz, big band, swing, blues. We're now moving into this new form of music, which is appealing to young people. They can now call it their own culturally and societally, and that starts to move forward. Okay. So that's why this is so important to our development and where we're going with the remainder of uh, what I'm going to discuss on future episodes. So now again, do you have any questions that have been burning in your mind since I've told you what I've told you here today? Not yet. If okay. I think of something as we progress, I will definitely bring it up. But sure. But right now, what you're saying, what you're saying, makes perfect sense, and I and I totally get the progression and the way that it's moving forward. So certainly, for and, now, and that, that's if you have no is. questions, that's great. Again, <laughs> yeah. many of your audience may have, and please feel free to ask yeah. uh, questions now. Let me again challenge everyone and tell everyone that, remember, I've only picked two songs from the 1950s. I'm leaving out Chuck Berry and Fats Domino, and they will come in later. Remember, we're coming back to do a Ex more comprehensive. Exactly. We're just doing the first 10, trying to hit every decade, and then, and then we'll come back and dive in deeper. So. Certainly. But the thing is, is... These guys were all doing their things, which were all influencing this human behavior and pushing us forward, which will become more and more clear. But now you have a foundation of, okay, here's where it was all starting. And this is the reasons why culturally and societally it was happening, this edgy new sound. But again, I can't stress enough, you can dance to it. And that makes people happy. Now, moving forward to the second song, which I listened to for this episode, which was Shaboom. Um, and that one was very different. It was the one with the, all the. You said acapella. Ensemble acapella style, yes, yes. although it has some, a little bit of accompaniment underneath it and woven into it various places. So where does that take us? Okay. So in this program, and one of the big challenges for me when we were doing this was to try and pick songs that still fall under the rock side or had such an impact on the rock side that they need to be included. Technically speaking, this is not a rock song, but it was during that development phase of rock music mm -hmm. and had a significant impact called doo-wop, which I will get into okay. in a couple of minutes. Now, Again, there's some history, and this is coming out of the blues side of the house. As I said in my previous videos that we uh, were chatting about, um, we had the Chicago sound, uh -huh. where we had yeah. that migration right. north and up into Detroit. Now, a lot of these musicians that were playing this, uh, the, uh, the blues uh, sound, they were older people. They weren't kids. They were older people. At the same time as I discussed in the portion that we had on Rock Around the Clock, you had young kids looking for their identity. Right. Bill Haley and his comments, Bill Haley was 30 years of age. Okay. To a 20-year-old, that old. means you're ancient. 
it, it's just the way it is. Right. Hey, I'm 60 and I have 40 people, 40 year olds who think that I'm ancient. So th this was a significant issue. Now, this song Shaboom was part of what we call uh, the doo-wop uh, okay. style. And it was literally started to be founded on a night in a town or a city. There would be uh, your lights in the city and you would have these small ensembles get together of four people and they would actually sing under the light. Okay. That was their stardom was mm -hmm. being under it. One that always comes to mind is a song by, uh, which was up for the running for the show, um, Good Night Sweetheart. And you would always have a bass singer there doing do 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 do. Right. I heard and, a bit yeah, of the bass. And there. you'll have that low end. Mm -hmm. And for the people then, the girls went mad about okay. that for whatever reason. This guy's got this huge, booming, dark voice, very romantic and all the rest. Well, when we look at Shaboom, Shaboom follows the same general idea. It was going from the rhythm and blues mm -hmm. and pulling from that directly, but it was done by young people for young people. I see, I see. So you had teenagers in their, you know, 18s and 19s that were now becoming stars singing this kind of music. Okay. So they're pulling from uh, the blues again. You're pulling it into more of a contemporary setting, which was now influencing the rock music of the times and doo-wop became its own sub-genre within see. the rock right. element. Uh -huh. Now, Shaboom itself went to number five on the charts. And really? Yes, it wow. went to number five on the pop charts. And it was the first one by a black group to do that. And this is where we come into the racial issues. As a Canadian, I'm very neutral on that because Canada, we didn't have slavery. Whereas we know Americans did have uh, uh, the institution of slavery for a couple of hundred years. Um, that actually plays into what's going on because... I'm sure it does. Although it went to number five on the charts, a few months later, a Canadian group called the Crew Cuts okay. then released a song. They were all white guys, went to number one. Okay, what's going on here? Yes, yes, there was this stuff so going on where it was now being accepted by the white audience mm -hmm. who tended to have more money than the black audience just because of the way that the uh, society was structured at the time. They had more free capital. Right. So, of course, they could buy more records. They could support the band more readily. And so it could go higher. And it charts. could go higher. That, that's just how this worked. So you're going to see this, especially through early rock and roll, of... Caucasianizing, if there's such a word, or making things white. Taking something that was played from the black community, the African-American well, community. It, it even happened earlier, you know, with the, sure. with the blues and with the jazz and, and ragtime and all of that. Sure. Where, where yeah, it, it was picked up by the white population, adopted, perhaps changed a bit, yep. and then the story continues. Obviously, it's going to continue in that way. And I would say it was even more so with the style of music and what was going on in rock music. Uh, because what was happening now is because of rock being so offensive to the later generation, they wanted something sanitized. I so see, you'll get Pat Boone singing the song Tutti Fruity, which was originally put out by Little Richard. Um, and it's totally sanitized and clean. I see. And it's, oh, come on. This isn't rock music. Uh, but again, I'm looking at it through the eyes of someone from 2020, not right, from the right, eyes of right. 1950. So the doo-wop groups, as you saw, they focus very heavily on the um, melodic and chordal mm -hmm. changes mm -hmm. between voices because that's what they used. And it was very rare that they had other instruments in there. Now, when they went into a recording studio, they could, it was more formalized then, but often this was more of an impromptu way of singing for people on the street. Much like we will see generations later for rappers and part of the hip hop culture. So, so tell me something, because, yeah. because when I listened to that, I associated it more with jazz than with blues okay right because remember i was i was listening to some of the harmonies yes that to me are very familiar in the jazz context right but tell me a bit more about why you pull that straight out out of the blues rather than the jazz because i'd like to understand that a bit more sure um 
when, when you come from the Chicago style of music, which is the blues music, B.B. Uh, King and people like that, these were, as I said, elder, more old persons who were playing this style of music, which involved guitars and whatever it was that they were playing. But as you moved into the doo-wop era, this was a fragment from those players. The early doo-wop groups were actually people who had played in Chicago blues bands and Detroit blues, not so much New York, but Detroit. And they were starting to come together in the inner city that were directly reflective. And again, now we're looking at geographical and cultural right, right. side of the house. If you were from the inner city, you probably weren't doing a lot with jazz, but you may be doing something with blues. I see. And so these singers, even though there's this jazz element to it, as you say, and the way they construct it technically, they weren't looking at it that way. I see. I they see. were much like the rap guys in the early hip hop movement. No, they just wanted to express themselves of what they were experiencing in the inner city. This was very similar to that. Okay. So yes, technically you are correct. There's a lot of jazz components that are going on within that uh, style. However, the actual individuals and where they were coming from was from the blues got background. It, got it, okay. So that again, you have this uh -huh. collision of these things, which then sprouts this new right. uh, area of study. Um, so a song like Shaboom, there was, in fact, online, if you go in and put in doo-wop songs, you'll come up with websites dedicated, and all it is is doo-wop. And it's these doo-wop, do 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 one person singing that, while then someone goes in a soprano voice or something and adds all these other elements to okay. it. So, during this period of the development of rock, because again, we also have to remember, this is very early in the phase. Rock could have gone in any different right, way. Right, right but it wasn't, it was moving in this cohesive direction, but you had these offshoots, which essentially pleased other groups that, well, it's not all bad. Listen to this, yeah, there's this uh, Satan's music that they're playing over here, but over here, this is more sanitary and clean. Yeah, we'll support this or we won't support this. So the, the beauty and the, the difficulty of rock music is that a lot of the legend, a lot of the myths, a lot of the information from the early period was not documented well. Today it is far, far, far better because we have media that allows us to do it. Right, right. Whereas some of this music, and, and especially with the doo-wop side, was very spontaneous. So they weren't pulling from a, necessarily a technical background. They could be, but not necessarily. But no one was there to say, what's your education in this? Well, hey, I just hang out on the street and I like the sound and therefore I sing it. Or it could be, where are you coming up with this? Well, I was trained at yeah, Berkeley no, School right, of Music and I understand how all these chords work together. Mm -hmm. It didn't work that way. It just was what they heard, what they liked of what they heard. Yes. And then how they reshaped it and and made it into their own. Exactly. And there's one final point to bring into this. Gospel music. Yes. Because gospel music, um, I had a friend of mine and uh, she once said to me, all the best music is sung in Baptist churches that are black. That's what she said. I'm not going to judge that on any level. That's all that she said to me. And we were from, uh, I was, uh, I had a, a fiance in Virginia and she's the one who made this comment. When I watch um uh, black singers from the gospel movement mm -hmm. in churches. Yeah, I get where this is all coming from. It makes perfect sense. Oh. And, and me living in Tennessee, I hear gospel music, you know, if I turn on the radio station or whatever, gospel is one of the things that is kind of like bluegrass or, mm -hmm. or country. As it permeates that, a whole bunch of styles. It's just part of the in musical environment. It is. It's there. And so a lot of these young people that went to church on Sundays mm -hmm. back in the 50s, because most of everyone did, yes, um, yes. they could be part of choirs. And they're now starting to hear, okay, how does this all break? And again, they may not know technically why this is happening, but they can sure hear it. And a lot of those, a lot of the singers who ended up being, um, having strong public blues or or jazz careers mm -hmm. they first learned to sing mm -hmm. they first learned their music 
in church. Agreed. And la much later on in our study, there's a lady by the name of Whitney Houston. Many of your listeners and watchers will know who Whitney Houston is. Yes, she was in the gospel when she started out and became a superstar in the contemporary music world. Um, I Will Always Love You was her big number one uh, song that she wrote. But yes, so sometimes when you ask questions, they're perfectly logical questions, but they don't necessarily have an easy answer of because course. of all of these influences. But that's what makes rock and roll so great. Now, having said all that, for our listeners... Yeah. Please give your feedback on some of the things. You may be able to help to clear up some of what I'm saying uh, for Amy so that if I haven't completely covered certain areas, you can provide some additional information. Because again, Absolutely. we're all here to learn. Um, and because, to be honest, my specialty is 70s, 80s, and 90s music. Although I know a lot about 50s and 60s music, I'm not as well versed as some of your audience will be, and I'm sure that you can provide some great direction to us. And that way I can get into a discussion and I can become more educated on this wonderful I think thing that we call all rock. of us are going to enjoy learning together in this, I, I agree. In this whole project. I agree. There we have the 50s, and this is the end of our discussion about the 50s in this, in this fast overview, decade by decade. And... Next episode will be in about a week's time coming up. We'll be covering the 60s. But before then, I will be sharing my first listens of the two pieces that I will be listening to in preparation for that episode. And I'm not going to tell you what they are. It'll be a surprise, but I hope you will watch for them and enjoy them with me. And I will see you soon.